Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Bowden. I'm here to provide you uh, this um, talk around NASA and the science of movement. Um, um, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes uh, before, just a, or a minute, or probably a minute just before um, everyone arrives, and then we'll make a start. So it looks like the attendees have, have slowed down joining now. So, uh, so good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name's Stephen. I'm a chartered ergonomist. Uh, part of my role as an ergonomist is representing the human factor during the design, um, the, the design process, whether it's in a manufacturing environment, a safety critical environment, such as uh, oil or gas or nuclear, or uh, even down an office environment where we're designing for humans. Uh, my main areas of interest are designing for improved wellbeing and productivity. And as I said, it, uh, we work in a range of different industries. Most of my work recently has been in manufacturing ergonomics, making sure that we design out um, musculoskeletal issues during the manufacturing process. I've also got an interest in some of the science behind um, movement and how much movement we need to stay healthy. And this is what this presentation is about. So um, a few years back now, I came across a lady called Joanne Vernikos who was the ex NASA life scientist. Um, and one of her roles was to uh, study astronauts when they were in space and the impact of microgravity on the human body. And lucky enough to meet her in Vegas, Las Vegas uh, conference as well. Um, so some of this talk is based on her research and, and how really explain to you guys that we, how much movement we need to stay healthy. So, uh, the Center of Disease Control in the USA now states that 66% of the US population are unhealthy from 50% 10 years ago. That's really interesting, isn't it? Where will we be in another 10 years if we carry on, in this, on this, at, this, at that rate? The World Health Organization, obviously in the news a lot recently, estimates um, that 3.3 million people die annually due to physical inactivity, making it the fourth leading cause of mortality. And Cambridge University did a uh, study, um, European Perspective Investigation to Cancer and Nutrition. They showed out of 9.2 million deaths in Europe over 12 years, twice as many deaths were due to inactivity as those from obesity. So some quite inter interesting um, numbers and statistics there. I've put this uh, present, these first two slides are really to sort of set the scene to give you guys an understanding of the, of the problem that we've, we've got really with modern life. Um, Stephen Blair um, is a professor in exercise science at the Arnold School of Public Health in the US. And he showed that uh, there's overwhelming scientific evidence that regular movement to allow for moderate fitness. Now, moderate fitness being, um, can you, uh, climb up a couple of stairs of uh, flights of stairs without being out of breath and being, being able to hold a normal conversation for example so moderate fitness has wide-ranging health benefits so not being super fit like the big brands will make out you need to be um being able to run a triathlon or a marathon marathon but just having moderate fitness so stephen uh followed forty thousand people to death um over a 16-year period and he showed that the leading cause of death was low cardiorespiratory fitness. He also showed that becoming moderately fit reduces the chance of early death generally by 50%. And very interestingly, outweighs the risk of common risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So you can see on this bar graph here, the low cardiorespiratory fitness outweighed, outweighs obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol. We, you know, we hear a lot about obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol, not so much about moderate fitness, just becoming moderately fit. So interesting um, study there from Stephen Blair, and like I said, he's at the, pub, uh, the Arnold School of Public Health. I was in the hospital a year ago now, um, and I've come across this, I thought this, this poster, which I thought was quite interesting. Obviously this is for referencing people who are over 80, but as you can see, 10 days in hospital leads to the equivalent of 10 years in aging in muscles for people over 80. So that's a rapid onset of uh, losing muscle mass 
when you don't move. And um, obviously over 80, it can be a faster rate as per this poster here. So we need to get people moving, whether they're in their 80s and children as well. We need to get them moving. But within the office environment, um, in my journey working in ergonomics, I don't do as much office ergonomics anymore. As I said, it's more on a manufacturing side. But within office ergonomics, I generally find that there's far too much focus on the ergonomic chair and there's far too much focus around the perfect posture and being having the screen at the perfect height and the keyboard in the perfect position. And I've sit, sit, sat through countless presentations on how to adjust your keyboard and your monitor. But where there needs to be more focus is moving away from making some, from someone as comfortable as they possibly can be. So they're just going to sit there for a longer period of time. So I believe that there is the ergonomic chair is a good thing. We want to be comfortable, but it's making sure people are aware that the benefits of the next posture, the benefits of normal everyday movements on the on the human body and how important it is. So we talk, we're going to talk about some of the um, right down to the cellular level, what's happening when we we're not moving. Um, but also it's uh, important to mention that obviously musculoskeletal disorders are, are an issue. Um, and especially if we're spending long periods of time in static, fixed, flexed postures, as you can see in this example on screen here. So um, Michael Adams is a professor in biomechanics um, at the Center of Comparative and Clinical Anatomy at the University of Bristol. Um, so he's an expert in biomechanics and his, his evidence has shown that prolonged stooping causes the normal reflex activation of the back extensor muscle to diminish and ultimately cease. So when you sit down for five minutes in this flexed fixed position, which we commonly see with people in the office or working from home, um, even if they have the most expensive ergonomic chair in the world, it's very common to see them in this fixed flexed posture. But he showed that five minutes in this full flexion produces the lower back's protective resistance to flexion by 42%. Whereas 100 full flexion movements during the same period only reduces it by 17%. So if you're up and moving, the um, reflex activation of the back extensor muscle is engaged, it's, the, it's awake. If we then sit down for five minutes in this fixed flexed posture, this extensor muscle sort of turns off in a way. And then if you were to then bend over, you were more at risk of injury compared to if you're up and about moving, there's less risk if you go into a flexion, full flexion 100 times. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Our body has evolved and designed to move from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep. Even if we give someone the best ergonomic chair in the world, they're going to move towards uh, that fixed flex posture. So it's really important to get people moving. The ligaments become stretched and this then leads to tissue creep um, or a, a potential herniated disc. One of the main issues with the disc, there's no nerves within the intervertebral disc. So this tissue creep is not, people don't necessarily know there's an issue and they have more pressing issues to deal with. But this can cause instability, which can remain for several hours afterwards. And that's when someone could be a risk of injuring their back. But it's alternating between flexion and extension is the key. So musculoskeletal disorders are an issue. If we sit still for long periods of time, that's going to increase the risk of musculoskeletal disorders. But what's going on? What's happened in recent time? Um, for people, as we saw in the, some of the statistics at the start, people are we're living longer, but we're not living healthier lives. But and one of the reasons for this, as Vernikoff says in her book, Sitting Kills, Moving Hills, in a book I'll reference in a moment. Modern technology has robbed us of normal everyday movements. Now, how many times during lockdown did we all use um, online deliveries? I know Amazon did their best business in history, all the online supermarkets, very, very good business. We would obviously out of a need because of lockdown, but how is this trend going to continue? People using online deliveries. That takes, that robs us of normal everyday movements. Our mobile phones, we glue to our mobile phones. They're addictive. We're spending excessive periods of time on our mobile phones. We can do literally everything on our mobile phones. We don't necessarily even need to get up off our chair to a complete 
our, our objectives for the day. Our commute to work is no longer there, not for everyone, but a large proportion of the population. Their movement, they were their main movement in the day was uh, achieved through their, their commute to work, which we've now potentially lost for a proportion of the population. Um, we can hire a taxi that can be out the side of our front of our door in three minutes. We spend long periods of time at home and at work at, on our computer. There is even these segues to, uh, we don't need to walk. How much is this going to keep happening in the future? How much of our normal day every movements are gonna be taken from us? As you'll see, those normal everyday movements are absolutely vital to um, living a long, healthy life. So the focus over recent years has been on how many hours we sit or stand for. This is the, the wrong way to think about it. Don't think how, how many hours did I stand today or how many hours did I sit for? The question you need to ask yourself, as Vernikos, the ex-NASA uh, life scientist at NASA showed, it's the number of times you go between sitting and standing that's key. How many times do you expose yourself to gravity? How many, how many, how much exposed, the more gravity that your body is exposed to, the better. Obviously not excessive G, but we need to be, obviously we all have one G loading down on our bodies continuously. Um, we need to expose our body to that regularly and as often as possible. And I'll try to make the case for that as we move forward now. So movement against gravity is absolutely fundamental. Um, now, gravity is our friend. If we use it regularly, from the moment we are born, gravity is our friend. We use it to grow and develop by playing. Gravity is our source of fun. As we become older, so as we move, or even when we get to school, we start to sit down and not move and get told not to fidget, sit still. Um, but as we get older, these, uh, this, this starts to become um, even more prevalent. As we get older, our brains are overloaded, but our bodies are now underloaded. As we get older, gravity becomes our enemy. If you don't regularly use it, it becomes our enemy. And we know this from some of the research carried out on astronauts. So what's happening when we sit still or stand still, as I'll come to in a moment? Let's just focus on sitting because we've got this picture here on the top left. When we're sitting still, what's happening? Now, Within your inner ear, in this top right picture, you have the vestibular system. And the vestibular, the vestibular system is one of the main areas within the body responsible for balance. Now, you obviously have proprioceptors in your feet. You have um, your inner ear and your eyes all connected. But the inner ear is one of the main areas responsible for balance. And it's also responsible for blood pressure regulation. So um, you may have noticed when you go on a lot, well, when we used to go on long flights or a long car journey, or if you sit down for extended periods, your blood volume in the lower half of your body will increase, um, which is highlighted by your feet swelling. And that when we stand up, for example, from sitting, the vestibular system within the inner ear senses movement in space. And then obviously it has to tell our heart and to get blood, the blood volumes pooling at the bottom of our body and needs to get blood quickly from up to bottom of our body up to our brain. Um, that's really, really important to, be able to do that. Now, if we sit still for extended periods, the vestibular system starts to sort of turn off like a light switch. You may notice it first thing in the morning when you stand up, you have to walk with a wide footing, like babies do when they walk. You can see this picture here. We, you walk like this when you first get up in the morning, or as we get older, we spend long, more, longer periods sitting and our vestibular system, obviously with age, becomes uh, less productive and less efficient, but it, it, it starts to shut down. And obviously we know this, we can accelerate this process by putting people in microgravity. This is Tim Peake, the British astronaut, when he arrived back from six months in space. Now in space, there's no gravity, it's microgravity. There's no up, there's no down. When you arrive in space, your vestibular system is in panic mode. It's spinning around like a compass. It doesn't know where it is. After a period of time, or oh, in the first period of time when they experienced this, the astronauts report feelings of sickness, being sick, feeling very, very unwell. After a period of time, the vestibular system turns off and then they can go about their normal day and not become dizzy. 
every time they move. But when they arrive back on Earth, the vestibular system still turned off and they, ha they have to learn to walk again. One astronaut reported um, standing up and falling forwards, but not even being aware that he was falling forwards and had to be caught by one of his colleagues. So that just shows you when we go into space, our vestibular system turns off like a light switch. But if we spend excessive periods of time sitting as you, and, and you'll see, or standing and not moving our head in space, the, our vestibular system and our blood pressure re regulation can be affected. So we need to keep moving regularly. Now, here's a comparison of physiological, physiological changes with microgravity and normal aging. OK, so when we put someone into space, and this is from, I highly recommend this book. It's a very short read. Joanne Vernacost in 2011, Sitting Kills, Moving Hills, the, the title of the book. Um, but here's a comparison from microgravity to 1G on Earth. So in microgravity in space, we have a decreased aerobic capacity by 10 to 20 percent. And it's between four and 180 days, that 10 to 20 percent drop off. Um, so some people, it happens much faster than others. And they're not exactly sure why that is. The last time I read up on it. Decrease in muscle mass by 1% per month in the legs and spine. Um, and a decreased lower bone density by up to 5% per month. I was at a conference a, a couple of years back when there was a researcher talking about how some of the Tour de France riders had observed a decrease in muscle mass in their, uh, in their lower back. Could they spend a long period of their life in full flex postures without needing to utilize their muscles in the lower back and without gravity loading their spine vertically, which was quite interesting. But you can see those, those three points. So decrease the aerobic capacity, decrease in muscle mass, and a decreased lower bone density up to 5% per month. Now on earth, we have a decreased aerobic capacity about our natural aging is about 10% per decade. Um, muscle mass, 1% per year in lugs, legs and spine and a decreased lower bone density up to 1% per year, okay, on Earth. Now, that's sort of natural, normal aging. Now, obviously, the world is changing. We're not, as, as I mentioned in the previous slide about modern technology robbing us of these normal everyday movements. The less we move, the faster this process can happen. Now, this, is, um, this graph is, again, from Sitting Kills, Moving Hills, and it's a hypothetical bone density changes as a function of age. So on the left-hand side, you can see bone density. And on the bottom axis, you can see age in years. Now, Vernikos talked about the risk zone. The risk zone being when a simple slip or trip would cause a fracture or a break in a bone. Now, your bone density peaks at 20, okay? So this maybe imagine you have three different individuals, one with um, who at 20 years old has grown up working on a farm, for example, continuously up, down all day, every day. They could have a higher bone density than someone who potentially spent their um, younger years work, playing on computer games. Now, the risk zone, as Verna Kost mentions in, in her book, those individuals can hit the risk zone much, much earlier. For an average person, about 80 to 85, people can start to get fractures from simple slips or trips. That's more common. But potential, if we're not get, if we don't get people moving and their bone density is peaking at a lower point, uh, a lower point where at 20, they could be hitting that risk zone much, much faster. So that's quite something to think about, isn't it? The, the benefits of movement. Now, some of you may have heard of the Mayo Clinic. Um, and if this was actually in the news, I think last month, um, Dr. Michael Mosley actually finally got onto this. Um, we've been, so this comes from uh, some research by Dr. James Levine um, at the Mayo Clinic in the States. And he coined, Dr. James Levine coined the terms non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So it sounds really complicated, but it's actually really, really simple. Now we've all got that friend who doesn't go to the gym, who has a terrible diet and manages to stay lean. Now, I can pretty much guarantee you that person will fidget and move pretty much all day. Now, NEAT, they will be having more NEAT. NEAT is energy used for everything we do apart from sleeping, eating or sport-like exercise. It includes normal everyday 
activity such as fidgeting, standing up, even putting something onto the shelf, gardening, washing the car, simple movements that you don't think would be classed as exercise are actually very, very good for you. So Dr. James Levine at the Mayo Clinic show, show the bulk of energy we use is not from the 30 minutes run. So a 30 minute run. So imagine we talk about this in some other research at the moment. We, we have a seven hour working day and we sit down for six hours of it at our desk, but we get our one hour run of a lunchtime. How many calories are we burning during that one hour? 200 calories mainly, depending on the individual. But the bulk of energy we use is not from that 30 minute run or the hour run of an evening. It's from all of these small, neat movements. Now, Dr. James Levine showed that neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis varies substantially between people up to 2,000 calories a day. That's a lot. 2,000 calories a day. We're not going on a running machine. We're not doing a triathlon. We're not lifting weight. It's just normal, everyday movements. And he also said obesity was rare a century ago. And the human genotype has not changed over that time. What's changed is people are moving less. If obese individuals were to adopt a neat, what he calls a neato type, they could potentially expend additionally an additional 350 calories per day. 350 calories per day over a week, month or year really starts to add up. And also it's shown that NEAT, when you move regularly, it suppresses the hunger hormone, which is quite a useful thing to suppress sometimes, especially when you spend a long period of time at home. Um, so yeah, it, that's quite interesting. And NEAT suppresses that hot hunger hormone as well. So just think about that. Next time you need to get up to, to, to go up the stairs, take advantage of it. All of these movements add up a calorie, half a calorie here and there over the whole day, week, month, year. That makes a massive difference. So don't focus too much on your ergonomic chair being perfect. Um, think, think about the even just perching on the chair, even just if you sat on a wooden bench, as long as you were moving regularly, I would prefer that as opposed to someone sitting in a thousand pound ergonomic chair in a flex position and not moving all day. Moving regularly is what's key here. So lipoprotein lipase, I said I'll talk about it down to, the, um, down to the cellular level. Now, lipoprotein lipase is a, an enzyme that grabs fat from the bloodstream and transports it into the muscle to be used as fuel during movement. Um, this enzyme reduces during, it, it becomes less productive during inactivity. So suppression of the lipoprotein lipase leaves excess fat in, in the blood where it increases the risk of heart disease. If unused, fat can be stored in the body, in muscle, bone, and even the liver and kidneys. But the most effective way to increase lipoprotein lipase is to participate in NEAT. It's regularly get up and move as often as you possibly can. Now, very interesting. They, um, if you were put in one of these G accelerators and strapped down, and we, um, you can actually, burn energy by not moving. They've shown, which is quite amazing, they've shown that this lipoprotein lipase is activated when it senses gravity. So if we strapped you down and you're not moving, but you're being exposed to gravity, lipoprotein, lipoprotein lipase actually is engaged and it becomes more productive. That's absolutely amazing. And that may make sense from an evolutionary standpoint that we've been the body needs movement throughout the day. And every time we move, our cells are exposed to gravity. And they've also been, they've obviously been accustomed to that. And regard, regarding lipoprotein lipase, it's shown that it actually uh, engages this, in, this, um, this process and keeps it in tune, keeps it working more productive. So if we keep it working more productive, actually, when we, when we actually need to use it, it potentially could burn more energy. So we need to consider lipoprotein lipase and the importance of in, in, increasing our exposure to gravity. So you may think that, as I mentioned, if you, I used to be this person where I used to do, uh, go to the gym over lunchtime, do my cardiovascular exercise, and then get home and think, yeah, great, I've done my, my exercise now, I can sit down for the rest of the day. 
There's more and more research now coming out. That's not the case. Going back from an evolutionary standpoint, your, the human body is, re is required to move the moment you get up or is designed or evolved, depending on your viewpoint, to um, continuously move throughout the whole day. But Rebecca Seagrin uh, um, did some research and she um, followed in 2014, 63,000 people aged 40 to 79 over six and a half years. And she showed that the, the assumption has been that if you're fit and physically active, that will protect you, even if you spend a huge amount of time sitting each day. In fact, in doing so, you are far less protected from the negative health effects of being sedentary than you realize. So if you're spending a long period of time sitting, just by going to the gym and doing your cardiovascular exercise, that's not necessarily going to reduce the risk of um, all of the negative effects of being sedentary. So alongside, which is lots of research for cardiovascular exercise, alongside that though, we need to make sure we're regularly exposing ourselves to these neat movements. We're regularly going between sitting and standing as often as possible throughout the day. But as I said at the start of the presentation, it's not about how long you're sitting for or how long you're standing for. It's quite common for me to be speaking to someone. They say, I've got my sit down desk and I'm standing there all day. Everything's great. I've been told that standing is better for you than sitting. Now, potentially, uh, as James Levine mentioned in his book, Get Up, the book was quite a good name, Get Up, but he mentioned in that book that st standing, actually you're more likely to move and fidget when standing. So you're probably, there probably is an advantage to standing as opposed to sitting. You're probably less likely to move if you're sitting. However, standing still is not the solution. It's the movement, as you'll see from the research in a moment, between those two postures that your body craves and requires. Now, there's only two calories per hour extra burnt when standing as opposed to when sitting, if standing still. So Thomas R. Walters um, did some, his PhD in 2015 at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in the USA. The literature review, literature review of the risks associated with prolonged standing. As you can see, there are a number of risks. Reduction in blood flow to the brain, that makes sense. If our vestibular system isn't engaged, our blood pressure regulation is going to be affected. Our blood volume in our lower part of the body is going to increase. That's gonna reduce blood flow to the brain. Swelling of the legs, dizziness, heart rate affected, increased blood pressure, um, chronic venous insufficiency. Musculoskeletal lower back and foot pain. You speak to anyone who works on their feet all day, they report this. Preterm birth, spontaneous abortions, varicose veins, reduction in blood supply to the muscles. So a number of issues there. So don't be fooled by thinking that standing up and standing still, or standing still is, the, is the, the, the solution. As you'll see here, it's the getting up. It's your exposure to gravity when you stand up. When you stand up, the musculoskeletal system is being loaded vertically. Obviously, when we're standing still, we do have one G loading down on us. But when we get up, that increases the loading onto our body. Now, Joanne Vernikos did some research um, and she had two groups in this study. And she showed that, oh, I'll explain the study first. So they had two groups lying down for four days, four days of lying down. Every 45 minutes, one group, so the group on the left, would simply stand up and stand still for 15 minutes. So that group had the, the variable of standing up against gravity, against gravity. The other group would, on the right, were, were not allowed to stand. They had the exposure of gravity removed from them. They were picked up by a machine and they were placed onto a walking machine and they walked at three miles an hour for 15 minutes. In both groups, they measured their bone density and their cardiovascular performance before and after. Now, all of the researchers were, their assumption was that walking would help to maintain their cardiovascular performance and also maintain their bone density. Actually, it was the other way around. The group that simply stood up and stood still for 15 minutes, they had the exposure to gravity, had less bone density loss, 
and less cardiovascular drop-off. And that's absolutely key here. It's not necessarily the walking it is absolutely good for you, but the standing up to walk is very, very good for you. Um, so they showed that it's required 16 times per day from lying down to standing up. So in four days, if you are fixed lying down, you can lose up to 25% in your, of your aerobic capacity. So we've seen a lot of people coming off ventilators. Seriously, their aerobic capacity is severely affected um, when they're just complete, completely lying down for long periods of time, similar to being in microgravity um, in space, with absolute no, but worse, absolutely no movement. But four days of lying down, 25% loss in aerobic capacity. But what they've recommended is 32 to 36 times a day. It's doubled it, basically. So 32 to 36 times a day, you need to go between sitting and standing. And it can't be when you get out of bed, do 32 to 36 squats. It needs to be spread out throughout the entire day. So you need to wait for your, in a way, your inner ear, your vestibular system to sort of settle down and then expose it again and then stimulate it again and regularly stimulate it throughout the whole day. I would even recommend, if you're working from home, practice standing on one leg. Lie down, on the, lie down if no one's watching. Um, if lie down on the floor and jump in the air. Do five burpees every hour. You need to stimulate that vestibular system. I remember last summer, I was, I've got two young children. I tried to do a roly-poly, and I'm 40 years old now, but I tried to do a roly-poly in my back garden, and I felt physically sick. The last time I did that, I do not remember feeling that sick. And it's because my vestibular system is not tuned up for this, but you absolutely can get it back into tune. You can bring it back online and you can make sure that your body is being activated regularly by going between sitting and standing as often as possible. Of course, if you lie down in the ground and jump in the air, that's going to be more exposure to NEAT, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, more calorie expenditure, and that's going to stimulate your vestibular system more than it would be just standing up. But please take advantage of every opportunity you have to go between sitting and standing. And if you adopt that approach throughout your life, whether it's taking the stairs instead of the take instead of the escalator, whether it's going for that regular walk, whether it's someone comes up to your desk when we go back to the office, if we go back to the office, stand up and speak to them. Every time you make a phone call, stand up. Any op um, a good one is keeping your drink of water away from your desk. So every time you need a drink of water, you're going to stand up. That's going to help down to the cellular level, your health, but also, as we mentioned, from a musculoskeletal perspective, it's going to help uh, reduce the risk of musculoskeletal disorders, uh, which is a good thing as well. So a quick summary. Um, too much sitting or standing uh, shorten your life, even if you exercise. In near zero gravity of space, astronaut muscles and bones waste away if they were rapidly aging. Sitting, standing all day at a desk or in long commutes or in front of the telly is similar to zero gravity. People focus on how many hours we sit or stand for. This may be incorrect. It's how often you interrupt sitting and standing that's good for you. So I'll ask yourself that question. How many times have you gone between sitting and standing today? If you do nothing else, going between sitting and standing 32 to 36 times a day may help reduce the risk of uh, common diseases such as type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases. Our body has evolved to live in gravity as a perpetual motion machine. It's designed to move from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. It's not designed to wake up, sit down, go to the gym or go for a half an hour run, then sit down again for the rest of the day. That's not what our body has evolved to do designed to move continuously. So people can return to normal health by using gravity as their friend and adding non-exercise activity, thermogenesis or NEAT into their lives. I hope you found that interesting. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention at the start, I work for a company called Morgan Maxwell. We provide ergonomics in offices and industrial settings, manufacturing settings. So. If any of you ever wanted any support from an ergonomics or human factors perspective, please get in touch. But thank you very much for your time.